Well, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in to our summer Bible teaching series for summer 2022 at NBC. We trust that these series will be an encouragement to you in your faith as you walk with Jesus and as you are better equipped to walk with others along their faith journey. We also want to remind you that at NBC, we are a year-round facility and we have a series of opportunities for you to engage in in keeping with our mission of growing resilient, biblically rooted families. So make sure you check out our website at muskokabible.com to get all the information. We'd love to see you up here this fall and winter. Well, before we uh, look at a passage in Luke chapter 1, as we continue to work through uh, Luke 1 and 2 uh, this week. Uh, just a note that Doug mentioned saying Merry Christmas, and Christmas is associated with presents, but also birthdays are associated with presents. And so I'm sure we'd all like to know what Doug got for Emily for her birthday. And yet, he doesn't need to tell you, because I know what Doug got Emily for her birthday. In fact, I knew yesterday what Doug got Emily for her birthday. Because yesterday, Doug actually gave me Emily's birthday present a day ahead of time. Doug and I went kayaking, and he had purchased a nice carbon fiber kayak paddle for Emily for her birthday, which is wonderful. And then he gave it to me yesterday to use. <laughs> so I appreciated that. But Emily, just so you know, as, as generous as your husband is, you're getting a pre-used kayak paddle for your birthday. So, is it good? Have you used it yet? No. Oh, oops. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. Yeah. Um, we cracked it on a rock, so it's not quite, uh, it needs a little bit of repair work. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah see, this is, this, and this is how Doug gets out of the hole. Compared to the other paddle, it's not nearly as good. Is that what you're going to say? Like, your paddle's better because it's curved? And the one you got for her is straight, not curved. And so hers isn't as good as yours. And that's her preference. Yeah, okay. Anyway, happy birthday, Emily. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Very. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, we enjoyed it. Uh, so this morning... We're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verses uh, 26 through 38. These are familiar words, but Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. This is the word of God. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Before we uh, consider this passage together, let's pray. Father, we would ask 
now that your spirit will uh, work in us to uh, hear the truth of your word as it has been read, to uh, sink it into our hearts. And Lord, as we try to understand it and think about it together, we pray that it will be uh, you who teaches us your truth. Help us to know uh, your voice and to see through the word a vision of your Son. And in seeing him, help us to love and adore him and praise him and also be conformed into his image. We ask these things in his holy name. Amen. Now, when you, when you come to a passage like this, it does raise a number of questions about things like uh, significance and the sorts of things that society looks at in terms of importance. And in our Western culture and society, there are things, of course, that we look at as being more or less important in terms of who people are. And if you were to take a moment, I'm sure you could uh, very quickly start to say what some of those things are. You know, and maybe even if you're a little bit uh, introspective, you might sort of do a quick, you probably shouldn't do this too often, but it's a really quick self-psychoanalysis and try to determine, you know, what is it that makes me tick? You know, what are the kinds of things that I'm striving for? What makes my life matter? You know, when I try to hang some kind of picture of my self-identity, when I try to think about what it makes my life meaningful, what gives me purpose, what gives significance, you know, what are, that, what are those cluster of things? You know, so frankly, in, in vocational ministry, an enormous problem is that a lot of people get their whole self-identity from the ministry that they do. And then sometimes you see horrific existential crises in people when they come to retirement age and they can't do what they used to do and their whole self-identity is bound up with a job or a task. And I, realize that's not, I realize that's not just vocational ministry. Those are the circles I'm most familiar with. Uh, but in all kinds of work, you know, people, their, their identity is their job performance uh, or, or their, their identity is their athletic ability. And uh, I'm not sure if you've noticed, actually, this is something I've come to terms with just very recently, actually. I, I, I was on my front lawn just about a week ago, and you know, I'm 43, and it occurred to me, I am not likely to ever go professional in any sport. <laughs> well, like, you know, I just, it was one of these moments where I, you know, I've always had this sort of illusion that if I just put in one really hard summer of practice, you know, then you could break into the Olympics or into the professional sports. But I had this moment where you realize everyone except Tom Brady, who is retiring from professional sports, is five years younger than me. Uh, like, you don't usually hear of the 43-year-old protege breaking into the NBA. You know, it doesn't normally happen. Uh, so you have to have this sort of self-awareness of like, well, who am I? And, and what makes me significant? And what does society tell us makes us significant? And for a lot of people, it's career, it's money, social power. Uh, increasingly, it's sexual orientation or ethnicity education, who knows us, the sorts of things that we do. And we are familiar, and increasingly, we are increasingly familiar in our social discourse with recognizing a gr groups that we say are sort of dominant and oppressor groups and groups that are marginalized and oppressed. And this is becoming a huge part of how we even conceive of society. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to work very, very, very hard to recapture a biblical view of significance. Because if we allow society or even our own fallen, needy nature to dictate to us what significance looks like and what we need in life to be people of purpose and meaning, we're going to fall, frankly, into idolatry. And so we need a biblical corrective. What does the Bible teach us? about a life worth living? What does the Bible teach us about meaning and significance? And this text is actually very helpful this way uh, because it starts with someone who is, we don't know for sure. 
So this is speculative. This is reconstruction. But on the basis of what we know of history, there is, you're probably on very, very firm ground for taking Mary to be 13, 14 years of age. This is probably marriageable age. This is marriageable age in the first century context. And so when we read this, we are probably not supposed to think of a mature woman in her 20s or 30s. We're to think of what today would be considered quite a young girl. And she lives in the middle of nowhere. There were biblical scholars who actually doubted that Nazareth was even a real town. Because it's never mentioned in the Old Testament. Now we have archaeological evidence that it did exist, and obviously the the Bible tells us it did, so it did. Uh, But we have also evidence that, yes, Nazareth is mentioned. Yes, it was a flat town, but it was very, very, very small. Just just, just a few hundred people. A a little cultural backwater. Just absolutely a nothing area. And so you have this young girl... In a culture where young girls are not valued at all for their intrinsic value. That is, young girls are valued for their instrumental value as potential wives and mothers. But not valued simply as image bearers of God and special in their own right. And so when we come to this text and we filter through our Western concept of relative equality between the sexes and her and someone being marriageable age, likely being an adult. And we we sort of read back all of our Western context of womanhood and empowerment and this side of, you know, the third or fourth wave of feminism. And we sort of have this view of Mary which is almost certainly wrong. But she is a little girl, just sort of coming out of puberty, not even fully through puberty, in the middle of nowhere. And she is the one who is given the task that is a greater blessing than any person in the history of the world had been given up until that time. And one of the astounding things is this. When God wants to send his son into the world and to announce the most significant moment in all of human history up until that time, he doesn't go to Rome where people are powerful and he doesn't go to Jerusalem where you have sort of the intelligentsia and the religious leadership of the Jews. He goes to the middle of nowhere and picks a candidate that you would never possibly imagine is going to be used so powerfully in his kingdom program as a little insignificant nobody in the middle of nowhere. So how does Mary become so significant? Because she becomes, in this moment, the most significant human being on the face of the planet. So, so what is it? You know, what is it that actually makes someone significant? It is not her age. It is not her sex. It is not her economic power. It is not her geographical location. And also, just to the side, have you ever, has it ever occurred to you that um, when God sent his son into the world, he also didn't wait until we had sort of internet technology. Uh, he didn't wait. He didn't send him to New York City you know, where he could just go on like the late night talk show circuits. Like, he didn't send his son into a place where there was air conditioning and taxis and Twitter. Like, he, he sent his son even in terms of historical unfolding into a place, into a time, into an era, into an epoch, which we would not look at as being overly you know, advanced. And so what makes all of this significant? It's the sovereign choice and unfolding plan of God. And so what makes Mary's life significant is the same thing which will make your life significant, and that is not finding significance in anything except the plan of God. 
That's it. Not where you live, not your gender, not your money, not your education, not even your ministry. Your significance comes from being caught up in this incredible, unfolding, providential plan of God, not only for your individual life or how you connect with your church or your faith community, not just for how you connect with your neighborhood, not just for your nation and this world, but literally your life is significant because you are an image bearer of God who is caught up in the unfolding plan of God for the entire universe that he is made and is directing for his glory. And if you conceptualize what that means to actually have been created by God, to have a role to play in his sovereign unfolding plan for the universe, if you have any awareness of who you are, then you will know that in no possible way are you able to take that role, whatever it is. And and who are we that we would have any role to play whatsoever in the unfolding plan of God? I mean, that's one of the things that actually seems bordering on absurd. Uh, You know, when you think about if you were going to pick people in order to have a role in the kingdom of God in this universe, frankly, would you pick you? And if you would, you know, you need to think again, but would you pick the person next to you? Uh, Do you want that person to have a huge role to play in the kingdom? I mean, this seems like such a bad idea in so many ways. And so if you just know us, you you can't possibly imagine that this is the way that God is going to bring glory to himself and change the whole universe. I mean, who are we that we would be given any role in this regard at all? And the answer is, God uses us Basically, not because we're so gifted, and not because we bring so much to the table, he uses us in spite of ourselves. Which is why we need grace. Which is why everything we are and everything we have to offer needs to be given to us as a free gift from God, because we don't have it inside. We don't have the intelligence, we don't have the wisdom, We don't have the godliness. We do not have the ability to discharge the responsibilities of the roles that God assigns us. No one is equal for these things. And Mary is not equal for these things. Which is why when the angel greets her, the angel has to say, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And that's the difference. This is where you know, we, we get to some a fairly poor theological line of, you know, uh, you know, hail Mary full of grace. It's drawn from this verse uh, where, where the language translated is, you, know, you are blessed or you are highly favored. So the root word in that expression is the word for grace, charis. And so Mary is being told, you are full of grace. She is. You are highly favored. You are filled with grace. But the mistake is to think that Mary is full of grace naturally and intrinsically and that she is like a reservoir of grace that has all that she needs and then enough to also pour out to people. She she is not a co-redeemer with Jesus Christ. She does not have her own merit or in grace to dispense to other people. In fact, the language is actually very explicit that she is full of grace because God has poured grace into her. That that she is, the grace of God has been poured out lavishly and overflowingly and super abundantly into her life so that she is highly blessed, highly favored, highly grace-filled. But she is not a natural spring of grace. She is a vessel that's been filled by the grace of God. You are filled. Filled with grace, Mary. Why? Because the Lord is with you. And that's where significance comes from. The poured out grace of God into our lives and the presence of the Lord. The Lord is with you. You can live in the middle of nowhere 
And if the Lord is with you, then you don't need to move somewhere to find significance. You, you don't need to wait until you get to your 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or retirement age or whatever it is. If the Lord is with you now, regardless of your sex or age or income or education, if the Lord is with you, that is exactly where you need to be to serve him and to do what he has called you to do because he's given you grace so that he can be with you. And so where you have people who know the Lord and walk with the Lord, where you can have an angel appear and say, just so you know, the Lord is with you. Like you. Like you, the person that you are through Jesus Christ, the Lord is with you. And all of a sudden you think about who you are and, and do you deserve to have the Lord as, as that intimate partner who surrounds you and goes with you wherever you go, that in him you live and move and have your being, not just in the sense that he's omnipresent, although that's true. You know, in, in one sense, everyone lives and moves and has their being in the Lord. But as believers, you, know, you, you live in the atmosphere of him, but connected in restored, loving, reconciled relationship. So, so that he's not just sort of the, the atmosphere that all of creation has to be in. He is your life's blood and oxygen and the water of life. He's, he's the lover of your soul. And, and you can't get away from him. And you don't want to get away from him. And you just enter more deeply and deeply into who he is. Because he surrounds you. He is the atmosphere of your entire life. And you rejoice in that. That's a gift of grace. And so for us. However you, whatever your, whatever your demographics. And, and tonight, Lord willing, we'll talk about social justice and we'll talk about uh, intersectionality, which is very important to understand today, very important to understand. But one of the things I want to demonstrate tonight is that we can very profitably actually move from the most burning questions of social justice and the most divisive questions of social justice today, we actually move through those very quickly and very kindly to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe that there, there are actually organic connections in, in the major issues today that, that Christians can actually build bridges rather than, than throwing stones at everyone who disagrees with us, including other Christians. Rather than burning bridges, we can build bridges. And one of the things that, that you begin to see is that the entire atmosphere of our individual lives can be about Jesus. But the entire atmosphere of society needs to be about Jesus too. And what we need is we need the gift of God's love and compassion and grace to so transform us as individuals that it begins to transform relationships. And as relationships transform, society begins to transform as well. And we'll talk about those things you know, later tonight. But regardless of your demographics, regardless of where you would sit in terms of an intersectional analysis, your significance does not come from all of that charting. It comes from God. It comes from the grace of God. So greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary, we are told, was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now notice, Zechariah was terrified by the angel. Recall that from last night or from your familiarity with the first 25 verses of the gospel. Zechariah is terrified by the appearance of the angel. Here, Mary is terrified or troubled by his words. That is very interesting. She's not so troubled by the angel as she is alarmed by his words. But his words were, you're full of grace. And what are you alarmed about? Well, how is that a troubling message? You know, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And she's greatly troubled at the words that he's just used. And I actually think that this probably is to show us that in some of our, maybe in some of our devotional lives, in some of our worship, in some of our church circles, you know, we, we have become a little bit too cavalier about what it means to have the Lord with us. You know, our, God still is a consuming fire. 
He still is the the God who who the angels can't even look at directly as they exist in his throne room perpetually crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so Mary, to have an angel come and say, just so you know, the Lord is with you in a special way. That's not something that she's flipping about. She, 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 She takes that message in God has poured out grace to me, but the holy covenant God of Israel, the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, who rules in majestic, transcendent, holy splendor, he is with me. So then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And then the angel says five things. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So, in Matthew's gospel, of course, we know the angel explains to you that you will give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus is the Greek form of you know, Joshua, means Yahweh saves or the Lord saves. And so, here you're being told. The, you will call, his name is Jesus because he is the savior of his people's sins. He will be the one through whom the Lord saves his people. And then five declarations. One, he will be great. Verse 32, he will be great. Now, you remember the angel says about John the Baptist, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Remember that uh, in terms of the announcement for John the Baptist when, he, when Elizabeth is told that she's going to conceive? That is essential to understand the difference here. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. It's a modifier to greatness. Great in a qualified sense. Great in the sight of the Lord. Other people are great and mighty in battle or whatever. Jesus is great simpliciter. Great full stop. No modifier. Not great in terms of teaching, or great in the sight of the Lord, or great in battle, or great in administration. Just great, full stop. And in the Old Testament, you only get that, that ascription of great with no qualifier, with no modifier, when you're talking about one person. And that's God himself. God is the only one in Scripture who is simply great, full stop. And now this language is applied to this son. You'll conceive someone who will be great. No qualification. Not great in the sight of the Lord, just great. Which is something which is only ascribed to Yahweh himself. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, this is where we run into something really important, but also a little bit tricky. So so when we hear that he will be the Son of the Most High, or we hear about the Son of God, Jesus is the Son of God, most of us in our churches and in our sort of our Western Christian tradition automatically infer that the statement he is the son of God, means that he's God. And and it will mean that, it does mean that eventually. But you have to work through the categories to get there. In in fact, that is not just the the automatic meaning. It it, it isn't. So we'll, we'll, we'll do this because it's, is it Monday? Monday morning. Everyone loves Monday mornings, and so everyone's awake on Monday mornings. Everyone wants to be engaged on Monday mornings. So, so we'll, we'll poll the audience, and uh, there are prizes. Whoever gets the best answer, uh, and Doug has no problem giving away Emily's birthday present, so maybe a carbon fiber canoe paddle for whoever gets this right. Just one of them, just one. Um, someone tell me. Who is the Son of God in Scripture? Who is the Son of God in Scripture? And we'll set Jesus out of this. Who else is referred to as the Son of God in Scripture? I can't ignore Ezra because I I did that once 
in class, and he never let me hear the end of it. So Ezra, yes. And don't get this wrong. This is a lot of pressure. In fact, this actually, if you get this wrong, reflects badly on me. So make sure that you do not get this wrong. And if he gets this wrong, I didn't teach him the subject matter. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, very good. Israel. Israel is called the son of God. In fact, this is what, this is the logic behind God putting the firstborn of the Egyptians to death. You have been killing my firstborn son, God says. I led my firstborn son out of Egypt, God says. Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I have called my son, which in the first instance is not actually a messianic prophecy. It's looking back in the past what God has done with Israel. So Israel is the son of God. Where else? Who else? What else? Adam. Luke's genealogy tracks back. Son of Seth, son of Adam, the son of God. So Adam is called the son of God. Who else? The angels, the sons of God. Genesis 6, whatever Genesis 6 is all about. You know, there's different debates. Uh, But Job 1, the sons of God came to present themselves before the throne, give an account of what they're doing. Most, a lot of Bible translations now will translate as the angels came to give an account. And that's, that's entirely fine. They are angelic beings, but they're literally called the sons of God. Well, who else? Who else returned the sons of God? Pardon? Yeah, you explicitly, your name is in the Bible. Uh, you know, you're right. Christians, Christians are called the sons of God. Again, literal speaking, not about, not about sex and gender, but speaking about privilege, because it was the male who received, who was the heir, who received the, the, the firstborn son received the double share of the estate. And so to be called sons of God means that you stand in the Greco-Roman world with that legal privilege of full heirship. So whether you're, regardless of biological sex, we are all sons of God in the sense of adopted to full heirship of the father's estate. So we are called sons of God. Who else? Blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be called sons of God. Just hang on to that one for a minute. That's excellent. Remember the Davidic king and the Davidic kingly line. Psalm 2, coronation psalm. When the Davidic king ascends the throne and is crowned and coronated, you are my son, today I have become your father. Psalm 2, 7. This is the coronation psalm. Every Davidic king is identified as the son of God. So then, to read, he will be called the son of the most high, or to say, oh, John 3, 16, for God so the world that he sent his, he sent his one and only son. Oh, therefore Jesus is God. We have to be a little careful with that language because you've got the angels who are God and Israel's God and the Davidic king is God and your God. And you know, there's a lot of gods because if son of God just means God, then all of a sudden we're in a lot of trouble theologically. So how do we, so what does this expression mean then? Well, in the first instance, to be a son of God is to be so related to the father that you represent him in the world. And so Adam is the son of God by special creation, but also as covenantal federal head of the human race. The Davidic king, even when he's wicked, is supposed to represent God to the nation and rule and reign over God's people on behalf of the father. The angels are like God in the sense of creation and also being spirit beings. Israel is God's firstborn because Israel's job was to represent the goodness of God's law in the world so that people would see them and say, my goodness, the wisdom of your laws and the righteous ordering of your society is so wonderful. Who is your God? And how did Israel do with that job? Have you read the Old Testament? And so what you, and how did the Davidic king do? How, how did the kingly line do? See, see, what you get is you get all this example of sons of God and all of them fail catastrophically in fulfilling their sonship obligation. And the entire history of Israel, the entire history of the Old Testament from the fall of Adam until this announcement begs for someone to come who will actually be the Son of God who acts like the Son in every way, who never fails, who fulfills sonship as a theological category. 
And in order for someone to actually fulfill it, they need to be great. Full stop. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. Now, there's another massive category of sonship, which I think is actually probably, I don't want to say it's the most important one, but it is essential to understand for these discussions. And that's what we refer to as functional sonship. You have heard the expression, like father, like son. Or, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Whatever. That's actually a biblical idea. So, so you recall John 8. And the Pharisees and the Jews are opposing Jesus. And Jesus says, you are liars and murderers. You will not listen to me because I tell you the truth. And you're trying to kill me. You are liars and murderers. So what's the, what's the conclusion? If you are a liar and a murderer, then whose child are you? What, is, what does Jesus say? You are children of the devil. You are sons of Satan. You are the seed of the serpent. What are you talking about? Well, like father, like son. Who is the first liar? Satan, who deceives Adam and Eve in the garden. And, and to deceive them, he deceives them so they'll do what? Well, they'll sin. But what's the consequence of sin? On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So it's like Satan tries to deceive them into drinking poison. He is directly re responsible for attempted murder of the human race. And so from the very beginning, he is lying and trying to kill. He's a liar and a murderer. If you reject Jesus, who is the truth, and you try to kill him, then you are a liar and a murderer. And that means, like father, like son, all I need to do is look at how you act to tell who your parents are. And so if you are a liar and a murderer, then your dad must be the devil himself. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Why? Because God makes peace. And if you are a peacemaker, then you are like your father. Like father, like son. You're called the son of God because you're acting like your father. Do you see? It's functional. It's how you function. John 5, the Jews once again are angry with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And he says, look, my father's working today, so am I. Say, what are you talking about? You're making yourself equal to God. Is, yeah, yes, I am. I do, he says, and then he says this is so important, so important to understand Christology. He says, I don't do anything except what the Father shows me to do. But everything the Father does, the Son does. Not just like Father, like Son. Like we make peace in an analogous way to God. But everything the Father does, the Son does. Now, for a child to do everything their parents do, they have to be equal to their parents. So, does the Father make a universe? Sure. But how? Through the Son. You have to be awfully powerful to make a universe. I'm guessing, like not having made one recently. You know, I imagine that takes a lot of power. You know, everything, can you imagine? So if I stood up here and I said, listen, Paul says to Timothy, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so I'm going to tell you, you need to imitate me. Um, but not only am I saying I'm an approximately a good model of Jesus, I just want you to know everything Jesus does, I do too. How long would I last as a speaker at NBC if that was the position that I took? Because just make that kind of claim. You say, look, who do you, you are claiming to be equal to Jesus. Jesus is claiming to be equal to God, which is either the most absurd blasphemy imaginable or it's true. And if it's true, this is where it comes together. To function as the perfect son of the eternal father, you have to be equal to the eternal father. To do everything God does, you can't be less than God. 
And so even this, this is where you get the functional and the ontological categories coming together. That is, the only reason Jesus is functionally the perfect son is because in his very nature, he is equal to the father. He is fully God. Or else he couldn't do everything that the father does. And so what you get is this incredible movement of biblical trajectory where you get all of these sons of God failing in all of these different ways. Jesus comes into the world and completely fulfills everything Israel was supposed to be. He fulfills everything David was supposed to be. He fulfills everything Aaron was supposed to be. He fulfills what every being in the universe is supposed to be. He is the perfect son fulfilling all of those. He's the, he's, that's why he's the last Adam. He fulfills what Adam was supposed to be. Everything, everyone who's a son of God fails except Jesus who fulfills all of those historical typological roles perfectly. And the reason he can do that is because he is a human being, but he's not only a human being, he's also God. He will be called the son of the most high because he has the same nature as the most high God himself. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That's where you start getting 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 2, 7, Davidic covenant, Davidic kingship. He is going to be given this throne in covenantal fulfillment. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. So the first thing is he's great. The second is that he's the son of the most high. Third is that he's given the throne of his father, David. The fourth is that he reigns over Jacob's descendants forever. Do you remember part of the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, is... David will always have a descendant who reigns on the throne. And, and of course, you know, it's been noted, there, there are two ways that this can happen. You, you could just have uh, replacement kings for the rest of time. You know, someone reigns for 50 years, and then, then another king is coronated, they reign for 50 years. You, you could have replacement forever, or you can have one person who never dies and never abdicates the throne. In other words, you can have one person who actually stays on the throne forever and ever and ever and ever, and that's how it's fulfilled. He is given the throne of his father, David, and he reigns over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And this is where you want to bring in um, Isaiah 9, which you've also made into a, uh, illegitimately made into a Christmas text. Uh, Isaiah 9, that, that a son is going to be born. You know, there, there's, there's a child who's given to us, a son who's going to be born, and he's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Here's a paradox for you. A son is going to be born who's called the Everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Eternality is built into the government of this promised child in Isaiah 9. He will reign forever and ever. That's a lot to hear. When you're a little girl in the middle of nowhere... How will this be? Note, Zechariah the priest says, how can I be sure that it's doubt? Mary doesn't doubt. She doesn't doubt that God is going to do this. She, she just asks, how? How are you going to accomplish this? How, how can all of this be? Since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. All of that richness of categories carried forward. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was un said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Now, there's something very, very special that's being said here. You will recall um, Exodus 40. Tabernacle is set up, and the Shekinah glory of God fills the tabernacle. When, it's when God literally moves in to the tent they've built, the tent he's commissioned. God's glory moves in, and no one can go in. They can't go in. They can't minister. The priests have to get out. 
when the Greeks translated the Hebrew Old Testament, they used a very special word. It's very rare. They said that the glory of God overshadowed the tabernacle. And that is the very, very rare word that Gabriel uses here to announce the message of God. But now it is not the tabernacle that's being overshadowed by the spirit and glory. It is a young girl in the middle of nowhere. And then you have to ask yourself, what is it that made the tabernacle and the temple special? What is it that made the holy of holies holy? It wasn't the architecture. It wasn't the design. It wasn't the physical space. It wasn't the materials. It was that God chose to specially manifest himself in that place. The holy of holies was holy only because God specially manifested himself there. Here, the same imagery of spirit and overshadowing glory is used, not of the tabernacle, but of the womb of the virgin. Such that you are supposed to think the womb of the virgin is the new tabernacle. The womb of the virgin is the holy of holies. Why? Because God is there. God is in the body of this girl in the middle of nowhere. Because Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, and from the moment of conception, he has the, the nature of a human joined to his full deity and divinity. And so Mary, in this sense, is rightly called the mother of God. Because as Jesus Christ, who we worship as God, and rightly so, as the body of Jesus Christ grows in the womb of Mary, that is where God is. Now, I'm not, this is not denying his omnipresence in the same way that the Holy of Holies does not mean that God is not omnipresent. It's not as if God was more in the Holy of Holies than he was in the courtyard, but he, he manifested himself in a special way here. He sanctified this ground, just like the burning bush. Everywhere God is, is holy in one sense, but he specially manifested himself in the burning bush to set that ground apart as special. The womb of the virgin is now set apart as special because God's son, who is God himself in terms of nature, is in her body growing as the person of Jesus, fully God and fully man. For no word from God will ever fail. More literally, uh, with God, nothing is impossible, but the context is clear. It's about his verbal promises and fulfillment. God is going to fulfill everything he has said he will do. This is a staggering message for anyone to receive. And here you do see part of the overflow of the grace that God gave Mary, that her response was, I am the Lord's slave. May your word to me be fulfilled. And that is the right response. Lord, you have said it. No matter how insignificant I am, if you will give me the grace and you will be with me, no matter what, may your word to your servant be fulfilled. And that's how we're supposed to respond. We're supposed to look to see what God is doing. We're to be open to his unfolding plan. We're to find our significance in his work, particularly through Christ. And we are to, no matter what, look for the fulfillment of his plan and purpose. But make no mistake, this text is not about Mary, it's about Jesus. This text is supposed to teach us about the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And as we talk about hope, 
with the memory verse this week, and with the song that we sang, note very carefully the words, because the words matter. O come, O come, Emmanuel, which means what? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. You are filled with grace. The Lord is with you. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until what? Until the Son of God appear. And when the Son of God, and when you understand sonship in those biblical categories, when you start to get a sense of what it means to actually be the Son, functionally and ontologically, then you get a sense of of what it means for that Son to be in the womb of the Virgin, and that becomes the new Holy of Holies. Then if you actually get that, and you understand that the gospel, this good news, is actually historically true, that this is not a story that's been made up to teach us that we're supposed to be open to the supernatural, whatever that means, this is profoundly something which happened on some Monday morning or Thursday afternoon in Nazareth. This took place. The angel Gabriel from the presence of God came and announced to this virgin in this place that the Son of God was going to be gestating in her womb, that her womb was the new holy of holies. And she responded by saying, may it be fulfilled to me, as you have said. And if you actually understand that her son was going to grow up as the son of God to live and die for us and to be raised to life, then you will know that yes, Israel was mourning and longing and begging for the Messiah of Emmanuel to come. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Ransom captive Israel. We're mourning in lonely exile here until the son of God appear. But when he appears, which he did, if you actually get that, what is the only possible response? Rejoice! Rejoice! Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. And he came the first time, making the virgin's womb the holy of holies. And he's going to come again to consummate the kingdom and bring in a new heavens and a new earth. And the imagery of the new Jerusalem is that it's a perfect cube, the size of which is basically immeasurable and unimaginable to a first century person. And there's only one cube in scripture, and that's the Holy of Holies. And the idea is that eschatologically in the new Jerusalem, the bride of the Lamb, before you couldn't go into the Holy of Holies or you would die. And in the new heavens and new earth, you can't get out of the Holy of Holies because it's too big. And the eschatological imagery is It used to be in the tabernacle, then it was in the womb of the virgin, but in the consummation of the new heavens and new earth, the holy of holies is everything and everywhere, and you will live in the presence of the holy manifestation of God forever and ever and ever because of this son, because of the son of God who was born of the virgin. Let's pray. Father, our our words and our thoughts and our emotions are always inadequate to what you deserve. So by your spirit, open the eyes of our hearts to that greater vision than we could ever have on our own. Open our minds, help us to give us eyes to see. Help us to see your glory and the beauty of your son. For we ask it in his holy name. Amen.